This is CGTN, China Global Television Network. Chinese Foreign Minister Wang Yi says China's assistance during the pandemic has no economic or political goals. China to strengthen laws to safeguard public health. And over 107,000 coronavirus cases confirmed across Africa. This is Africa Live. Welcome to Africa Live with me, Beatrice Marshall, in Nairobi. Also coming up on the program. In business news, South African firm offers delivery services using bicycles. And in your sports, online gaming experiences a major boom amid the COVID-19 lockdown. We begin with the third session of this year's National People's Congress. Today, Chinese Foreign Minister Wang Yi met with reporters at the Great Hall of the People in Beijing. He answered questions on China's foreign policy and diplomatic relations. He also addressed the COVID-19 pandemic and the lessons that it's had for human communities. In my view, the most important thing we could learn from COVID-19 is that the life and the health of people in different countries have never been so closely connected. Also, it has never been made so clear to us that all nations live in the same global village and that humanity is in fact a community with a shared future. And talking about China's assistance to other countries during the pandemic, Wang Yi said some political forces are mischaracterizing China's intentions, but Beijing has been transparent about everything. He said the Chinese people are grateful and are always ready to reciprocate acts of friendship and kindness. Wang Yi emphasized that none of China's donations or medical assistance was done out of geopolitical calculations or for economic gains. He also touched on China-U.S. relations, saying there should be more cooperation than divergence. China has no intention to change, still less replace the U.S. It's time for the U.S. to give up its wishful thinking of changing China or stopping 1.4 billion people's historic march toward modernization. And we earlier spoke to Dr. David Monyai, who is the director at the Center for China-Africa Studies at the University of Johannesburg uh, on China-Africa relations. The, the state of China-Africa relation is strong. I think what defines it are the events that has um, undertaken uh, through the three phases, the liberation phase, the post-independence, uh, and, and the now new era. Uh, the uh, post-COVID uh, era, uh, where we see the relationship going to quite a number of other areas, uh, from economic, uh, politics, um, social, people to people, and uh, the mutual understanding that uh, the two people uh, face similar challenges uh, at a global level. And therefore, I think uh, both Africans and Chinese are responding uh, to their own environments and, and, and at the global level in a much more united and a common approach. This is an important uh, session uh, of uh, Chinese parliament uh, on their calendar. And uh, by that, uh, Africans are also looking quite closely uh, to see what are changes that are taking place within China, uh, particularly this year in light of the uh, COVID-19, what measure uh, at the policy level are uh, the Chinese uh, and Chinese government are taking to alleviate the situation uh, at economic level, social, developmental, and what to learn. But far beyond that, I think there is also uh, an understanding in which uh, China and Africa are also looking at how best to deal with the changing global order 
uh, with a lot of challenges, tensions, and how best to continue uh, with the good relationship uh, with less hiccups. Ch um, Af China has helped Africa in so many ways. I think we could uh, look at how China, at institutional level, um, the China Center for Disease and Prevention has helped its counterpart uh, here in Addis Ababa in Africa, um, Africa Center for Disease Control and Prevention, uh, in terms of um, upskilling um, African health workers, uh, ensuring that you put certain protocols uh, leaning on how China has dealt with the uh, COVID within um, China, as well as um, sending quite a number of um, medical consignments to, the, to most African countries. Uh, Jack Ma of Alibaba, I think, have sent uh, numerous consignments to almost all African countries. But we also see the Chinese government uh, increasing the number of African students learning in China. I think in light of um, uh, the current situation, uh, uh, African governments are required to increase uh, the training of uh, health workers, as, as well as knowledge in these areas. But more importantly, the question of digital uh, economy is quite important, and how Africans are going to handle with the post-cold uh, COVID um, in a manner that uh, that will assist uh, using uh, technology. As these are some of the issues in which uh, China is helping Africa, as well as uh, Africa working with China uh, within multilateral structures, working together as partners. Meanwhile, CGTN's Girum Chala had an exclusive interview with Mr. Kwate Thomas Kwesi, the deputy chairperson of the African Union Commission, who spoke highly of China-Africa relations. He also thanked China for its efforts in helping African countries battle the COVID-19 pandemic. He added that China has set an example for Africa to pull the population out of poverty. Let's listen in. Mr. Kwasi Kwate, uh, Deputy Chairperson of the African Union Commission, thank you so much for talking to CGTN. The China-Africa relationship is one of the most remarkable relationships, both in terms of uh, bilateral and multilateral relationships, as we know. But how do you really evaluate the current status and the way it has evolved uh, throughout uh, the years? Thank you. Thank you very much, and uh, thank you for having me. Um, can I begin by thanking the government and people of China for their continued support to Africa, for their belief in Africa in the long term, evidence of which is this magnificent building that was donated to Africa. Uh, China, like Africa, has faced problems of invasions, occupation, and as a result of that, understands Africa's position probably better than most. Uh, even when China was not was a relatively poor country after the victory of the Communist Party in 1949, where Mao Zedong said China stood up. China has been in Africa's camp. They helped the Tazara Railway. They supported our liberation movements. And lately, the rise, the peaceful rise of China is a demonstrating, demonstration to Africa of just what is possible, the right ideology, the right philosophy, the right leadership. Uh, so we value, we value the relations with China. We are both historical people. We have a long history. This China-Africa relationship has also demonstrated its uh, strength at this uh, difficult time of the COVID-19 spread. China has been uh, at the forefront of Africa's uh, battle against the coronavirus. What do you make of uh, this uh, Chinese effort and the synergy between uh, the two? They have actually assisted in preparing us for the worst aspects. I mean, Jack Ma Foundation shipped three plane loads have helped us to get some points to take these and to have them distributed and it will be extremely useful. So we appreciate China's support, the PPEs, Jack Ma's foundation. I mean, China has uh, 
lived up to his promise. And uh, we're very grateful. In terms of taking lessons from the Chinese experience of economic development uh, or other success in different sectors, what do you think Africa can uh, pick, really? We believe that the rise of China and the ability to pull over a billion people out of poverty is the best example to Africa to show that with unity, proper economic policies, good leadership, integrated community, Africa can become the next manufacturing center and can pull Africans out of poverty as well. So China remains not only an indispensable friend, but also a great example. And the rise of China provides Africa with many other strategic options, which otherwise we would not have had. So we really do value our relations with China. While the coronavirus spread and global reach has been a source of concern and a call for collective action to prevent the virus from spreading further. But the U.S. administration has been stigmatizing China when talking about the origin of the pandemic. During his press conference earlier today, China's foreign minister Wang Yi said, and I quote, some political forces in the U.S. are taking China-U.S. relations hostage and pushing the two countries to the brink of a new Cold War, end quote. Officials with the African Union have voiced their opposition to stigmatization. Take a listen. It's unfortunate. There are all kinds of powers who like to denigrate China, who like to put China in a hole, who are even probably jealous of China's rise. So that is to be expected. However, it is for us to act together timelessly in a transparent manner. And it is transparency that dispels all kinds of uh, defamation. Truth, transparency, openness, governance are the undergirds of stability and progress and friendship. We cannot do, we cannot, there should be no issue of stigmatization in this because it's affecting one and everybody. COVID has no respect. Whether you are rich, whether you are poor, whether you are tall, whether you are black, whether you're white, you can't be affected by COVID-19. It just shows that the most basic, important thing in the whole world is our human nature and how we can safeguard our humanity. That is what is most important. I think uh, the common understanding is that uh, we put the novel coronavirus. And associated with that uh, novel coronavirus is a disease called COVID-19 disease. I think that's the common usage. It's only a very small number of people trying to go out of, uh, of that uh, usage. And uh, I think uh, that is going to hold. That's my view. Mm -hmm. Because, uh, you see, it's very, very, very difficult. Every day, humanity faces possibility of a pandemic from any source. That's the nature of the world. It can come from anywhere. Mm -hmm. There is no 100% immunity that... Uh, there's not going to be any pandemic where the pandemics are behind us. No, they can come any time from anywhere. And they, you think it's better we give them scientific names. China is planning to formulate or revise a total of 17 health-related laws in order to strengthen legal safeguards for public health. Shen Chunyao, who is the director of the Legislative Affairs Commission of the NPC Standing Committee, says the COVID-19 epidemic has exposed some problems in legislation. He also indicated the need for systematic law revisions and improvements. The legislation plan calls for efforts to formulate the biosecurity law and revise the law on animal epidemic prevention. CGTN's Wilkista Nyabwa spoke to Dr. James Ogutu, the chairman of the Department of Medical Microbiology and Parasitology at the Kenyatta University School of Medicine about the importance of legal frameworks in bolstering health systems. Looking at uh, the current scenario of COVID-19, there is so much need for effective healthcare systems globally, not just in China, or in Africa. But when you look closely to the healthcare system 
in China, you will find that it is more well developed compared to the one in Africa. You will find that in China, you have uh, a better specialist coverage of the healthcare systems. You would find that in China, you would have specialist hospitals, a cancer hospital, a women's hospital, a cardiovascular disease hospital, and so on and so forth. Uh, we may not have the same kind of uh, structure in China, mm -hmm. but I am aware that in China, the health system is very much uh, uh, citizen oriented. If there is a health regulation or a health guideline in China, mm -hmm. you would find that the implementation would be very strict. Mm -hmm. And that strict mm -hmm. adherence to regulations, guidelines, and laws would be very useful in, uh, at a time of a pandemic uh, like today. How crucial is legislation in terms of uh, ensuring that everybody has access to proper healthcare services. Legal frameworks will also uh, highlight or uh, would be able to anchor issues of indemnity when we come to the healthcare providers, uh, the healthcare uh, actors, uh, the, health, the healthcare personnel, as well as will also highlight issues to do with insurance for the public. So it is very important that these legal frameworks are set in place to cater for uh, extensive use of the healthcare resources and facilities. Mm -hmm. And of course, you would be very much uh, interested to know mm -hmm. that one of the problems that uh, bedevil the, 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 the low income countries mm -hmm. or countries in Africa and other parts of the world mm -hmm. is uh, the inability of uh, efficiency in policy implementation. In other words, uh, sometimes there is lack of political goodwill, or in certain cases, there would be corruption. This would be dealt with very clearly in a situation where there is a proper legal framework. The Chinese have done exemplarily well in the face of the pandemic. And if in any case they have uh, realized that there are some weak laws that they need to strengthen in order to be better for future purposes, I think that is commendable. And so African countries may also look into their laws and find where there are loopholes so that when we are faced with such adversities and pandemics like the one we are in today, we can better address every problem that we face. In Nigeria, the director of the local Center for China Studies believes that the national security law proposed by the two sessions this year is to adapt to the current changing situation. In response to the riots and sabotages that have, be, that have occurred in Hong Kong in recent years, Charles Onunaiju says the National People's Congress has the right and obligation to make Hong Kong's national security legislation. People who read the basic law should understand it that uh, China, Hong Kong is not a separate political entity. It only enjoys high level autonomy within the sovereignty of the People's Republic of China. Given the fact that certain elements within Hong Kong have lent themselves a lot more freely to be used by external forces who seek to undermine China. So it is absolutely important to update and plug those holes and gaps <laughs> that we make Hong Kong a bridgehead for destabilization of the whole China. So for me, the National People's Congress has fulfilled its obligation, not only to the Hong Kong people, but to the entire Chinese people, in updating and plunging the loopholes in the basic law relating to national security with regards to Hong Kong. A former South African diplomat says trade protectionism is now on the rise and countries should oppose it. Gert Grobler, who once served as South Africa's ambassador to Madagascar, Japan and Spain, says countries need to embrace openness and fairness in trade. He also says nations should participate in promoting good governance globally by fighting corruption instead of imposing their own conditions to trading partners. He also praised China's open business policy, which he says has enabled it to recover quickly from the COVID-19 pandemic that has hit the world. Although they did not say, uh, make a prediction on the economy, I am of the view 
given the robust nature of China's economy, given its technological strength, given the fiscal and economic, uh, the fiscal and monetary policies that China has adopted, these are just some of the issues that lead me to believe that China is going to recover much quicker from mm. the the fallout of COVID-19. That China was going to continue to build, to work towards a moderate and, and a moderately prosperous society. And I think some of the, the issues that he lifted out was to open up the economy. I think this is a very important issue and uh, which is welcomed by the international community and investors. And also from a foreign policy point of view, the very strong commitment to multilateralism and international cooperation. And then, of course, also the key role that China will play in future in improving global health, uh, health governance. You're watching Africa Live, still ahead on the program. Over 107,000 coronavirus cases confirmed across Africa. And cargo truck drivers in Uganda call for quick release of COVID-19 test results. Each day, there are millions of stories. Each one can open new perspectives, new possibilities. Wherever you look, we are there to see, discover, explore. We put the pieces together to find what really matters to you all around the world, all around the clock. Our reporters are at home across the globe. From our headquarters in Beijing and production centers in Washington, Nairobi, and London. China Global Television Network. Stories from across the globe, reaching people across the globe. CGTN. See the difference. Africa continues to report more cases of the coronavirus. So far, over 100,000 cases have been reported on the continent. Over 42,000 recoveries have been confirmed. Africa has a relatively low death toll with over 3,000 recorded. Across Africa, Muslims are marking the Eid ul fitr holiday without the usual funfair. Nigeria's President Muhammadu Buhari observed the holiday from home. Nigeria continues to have the highest recorded number of cases in West Africa. A majority of the new cases were reported in the country's north, which is predominantly Muslim. Meanwhile, Kenyan President Uhuru Kenyatta has announced a plan to jumpstart the country's economy as it battles COVID-19. The Kenyan government plans to inject over $500 million into the economy. Over $2 million will be dispersed weekly to vulnerable families. President Kenyatta has also announced plans to inject around $28,053,000 million of seed capital for small and medium enterprise. Ethiopia has on Saturday reported one of the biggest daily increases in the number of COVID-19 infections. Authorities have said the rise in cases points to the fast spread of the virus across the country. CGTN's Girum Chala has more. On Saturday, Ethiopia had conducted 3,757 lab tests and 61 people were confirmed positive for the COVID-19 virus. This is one of the recently registered highest number of cases in the country. Alarming too. Making matters worse is 45 of these cases were known to have neither contacts with a COVID-19 patient nor have travel history. The total cases in Ethiopia from Saturday stands at 494. The Ethiopian Ministry of Health in its daily report said out of these new cases, 43 were male and 18 were female. And their age range from 17 to 70 years with the capital of December by taking the highest share 
of the total number. So far, the city has registered 62% of the announced total number of cases in Ethiopia. There is about 304 people out of the close to 500 confirmed cases come from the capital city itself. Since Ethiopia has increased its testing capacity from what was few hundreds per day to at least 4,000 within 24 hours, it has managed to test as many people as possible. And that has resulted in the number of confirmed cases to rise by the day. Health authorities and the government predict uh, the next couple of months might be the most difficult times for Ethiopia as the coronavirus pandemic could spread in a way never seen before. Grumtara CGTN, Addis Ababa, Ethiopia. Health systems around the world are battling the COVID-19 pandemic. UN officials are, however, warning that gains made in the fight against diseases such as HIV AIDS could be lost. CGTN's Nick Mudimba looks at the impact the fight against the virus has had on Kenyans living with HIV. This is Dandora, one of the informal settlements that dot Kenya's capital city, Nairobi. Here we meet Celine Akinyi. She's a victim of the world's current focus on the COVID-19 pandemic. One would wonder why and how. Well, Celine is living with HIV, having contracted the virus nine years back. Her eight-year-old son and five-year-old daughter are HIV positive too. As the common adage goes, walls have ears. Her walls are literally porous and out of fear of free-talking neighbors and stigma, Celine speaks to me in a low voice, a measured tone. COVID-19 could not have come at a worse time, she says. Now that we're in the COVID-19 period, we must also struggle with my positive condition because it's a must. I'm trying to look for food, which is the priority now. Food comes from the HIV program, but it doesn't reach us. People come here and take our details, but at the end of the day, we don't get anything. So I have to struggle with all these children and there's not enough food. Even now, it's only tea available here, and they took their drugs, so life is very difficult. Before COVID-19, things were a bit better. Celine and her children received their prescription on time. They also benefited from food rations. This is no longer the case. Her future and that of her children are bleak because focus has shifted from people living with HIV to COVID-19. Visits by counselors have become rare and far apart as they also fear COVID-19. Currently, you know, most women living with HIV are more vulnerable to COVID-19. So they cannot interact as usual. Yeah, and also most of them are, have defaulted from medicines due to lack of food. Yeah, so we have tried to, we have minimized our conversations as usual. For Nancy Onyang, also living with HIV, it hasn't been a walk in the park. The frequent nutritional gains they used to get now depends on the viral load and the organization taking care of the welfare isn't aware of the food distribution procedures. We are given nutritional food when the viral load is low and when you've lost weight. As long as you gain weight and your viral load has gone undetectable, then you won't get your nutritional foods. The organization The organizations that are giving food mostly focus on the well-off, and there are so many parents because of stigma that are hiding down in the slums. We only know them through their children. Because of stigma and discrimination, And herein lies the dilemma: the untold suffering in silence of patients suffering from other ailments, and whose plight has now been pushed to the periphery thanks to COVID-19, and this is raising concerns in medical circles. Yes, there is a risk of, of, of reversing those gains if we do not uh, put in place a mechanism, a strategy to ensure that um, services for HIV continue uh, uh, normally, just before the same way they were before COVID-19. In 2018, some 470,000 people died of AIDS-related deaths in sub-Saharan Africa, and an estimated 25.7 million were living with the virus, 16.4 million on antiretrovirals. Should COVID-19 curtail treatment services for six months, new infections in children could surge by as much as 37% in Mozambique, 
78% in Malawi, 78% in Zimbabwe, and 104% in Uganda, according to the 2020 World Health Statistics Report published by the World Health Organization. The report reflects that the rate of progress is too slow to meet the sustainable development goals and will be further thrown off track by COVID-19. The new statistics shine a light on one of the key drivers of this pandemic, inequality. This inequality is real for people suffering from other ailments. The quest to stay healthy is evident from Celine and her young family. All she needs now is the government support to help her bolster her lifestyle and of course keep her children healthy and of course affordability to also go to school. Nick Mudimba, CGTN, Nairobi, Kenya. In other news, cargo drivers from East African states are protesting at the Ugandan border after a delay in getting their COVID-19 test results. They are also calling for the ease of regulations targeting foreign trucks as they transit through countries in the region. CGTN's Isabel Nakiria brings us this report. Traffic at the different border points in the region is at standstill. Cargo trucks have been on queue for days waiting for their COVID-19 results. And the crowding is causing fears of transmission to the community around the border areas. There's even no food here, no water. We are just too stressed. We're tired and fed up. The truckers are not allowed to proceed with their journeys once they turn positive. Uganda has so far turned back over 200 foreign truck drivers who tested positive. And the other ESC countries too are doing the same. Uganda is a transit route for a large number of trucks destined to Rwanda, destined to South Sudan, destined to the DRC. So it is unwise for us to keep on keeping them in our country and treating them here. They would fill up all the hospital spaces. This week, Uganda revised its coronavirus cases downwards by striking foreign drivers off its tally. The decision to remove foreign truck drivers was made by President Museveni. Other regulations also forbid the truckers from stopping at undesignated points. Even if you want to stop and eat, you are not allowed to get out of your truck. You are chased away instead. Uganda's Ministry of Health says they are improving their systems to have COVID-19 results returned faster. Bringing samples from the border points of entry to the central region where we are testing takes a bit of time. But when the tests are done, results need to be returned in the shortest time possible. We have now managed to put computers so we can scan the results and send them back online. Guidelines by the World Health Organization requires that each country adds all cases that test positive to their tally. A meeting of heads of state from the East African region is due at the end of this month. It's hoped a solution on how to resolve the issue of cargo movement and the testing of drivers could be got. Isabel Nakiria, CGTN Kampala, Uganda. The spread of the novel coronavirus is having a significant impact on South African dentists. Many are limiting their practice to emergency cases only, while others have been closed for almost eight weeks due to the lockdown, causing severe financial pressure. For those who have reopened, it's now a new reality for patients and practitioners. CGTN Julie Shire reports. COVID-19 has changed daily life in South Africa. A simple dental appointment has now become a cumbersome procedure. Dr. Sam Tander's practice reopened with extra stringent rules. So you come in, you have your temperature taken, all your personal belongings are put into a Ziploc bag. You aren't allowed to touch or interact with that. Your hands are then disinfected. You've got to come in wearing a face mask. And the fifth layer is pretty much disinfecting your shoes as you come into the clinical environment. Keeping good hygiene in his practice is nothing new for Dr. Tender. Patients, however, say they still feel nervous. 
I think naturally a lot of us go through anxieties of, visit, of visiting the dentist, whether it's in the pandemic or not. So I think during the pandemic, my only concern was obviously that of my safety and that of my well-being. There's a lot of adjustment from a consumer perspective that I've had to take on board in terms of making sure I'm wearing my mask and I'm taking responsibility of, you know, social distancing. For many dental practices, especially the small ones, the lockdown has been financially devastating. I don't think in the history of me practicing over the last 18 years that we've ever been shut down for, for that length of time. So purely from that perspective, it's been a huge financial burden because you've got the same overheads, you've got the same costs. First and foremost, figuring out how dentistry will look in the new normal worries some in the profession. But Dr. Tender sees the pandemic as a positive time for dentists to reset. Prior to COVID-19, our practice had a huge digital drive and all of that allowed us to provide treatment in the most efficient time possible. Now being faced with the pandemic, we want to limit contact time that we have with our patients. Practices that are involved with technology, practices that are incorporating digital platforms would pretty much become the norm as things go ahead. The new normal brings numerous challenges. The critical thing we all need to look at at this point is sustainability. Whatever we do now has to be something that we can maintain long term, you know. It has to be something that we can maintain for every single patient coming into the clinic. We've got to treat every case as if that patient is COVID positive and an asymptomatic carrier. And we needed to find the silver lining with that. There's no way to predict if life will ever return to what it was. But dental professionals need to conform to this new reality, ensuring safe conditions for both staff and customers. Julie Shar, CGTN, Johannesburg, South Africa. Now, since the COVID-19 outbreak, the Wuhan Institute of Virology has been the subject of some conspiracy theories circulating across the world. Some U.S. media outlets and politicians have spread claims that the COVID-19 virus was leaked from the Wuhan lab, causing the pandemic. However, some closer to the situation say otherwise. CGTN's reporter Hu Chao speaks with the head of the Institute for an exclusive interview. This疫情发生以来,就外界一直有一种这样的声音,这样的说法,认为新冠病毒是从我们武汉病毒所泄露的,才引发了这次全球流行的这样的一种疫情。您怎么看这个问题?这种说法完全是无中生有的,因为武
冠状病毒呢有一个名称叫做 RATG 十三，嗯，可能在呃普通人看来，百分之九十六点二的相似性已经非常的高了。但冠状病毒它其实是基因组最大的 RNA 病毒之一，所以拿新冠病毒举个例子，它全基因组有三万个碱基左右，那三点八的区别的话，其实对应的就是一千一百多个位点的这种差异。那在自然界里面，呃，病毒它要通过自然的进化累积到这样一个数量的这个突变的话，其实需要一个很漫长的过程的，嗯，而且呃，近期我们注意到，应该说是全球病毒进化的一个顶尖的学者，呃 ，Edward Holmes， 他发了一篇这个声明，啊、呃，就认为这个 RATG 十三的话，在自然界，呃，也需要。五十年左右的时间才可能进化到这个新冠，而且您想，就是一千一百多个位点的不同，这个数量本身已经很大，然后你这些这些位点还刚好都要对应到新冠病毒的这个相应的位点上，就刚刚好是这些这一千一百个位点发生突变，并且刚刚好变成新冠病毒的那个样子，所以这里面的概率可以说是微乎其微的，可能很多人都会有一个误解。就认为，呃，既然武汉病毒所报道了这个 RATG 十三和新冠病毒基因组的相似性，那么你武汉病毒所就有这种病毒，但实际上不是这样的。就我们只是在对蝙蝠样本进行测序的过程中，知道了这个 TG 十三病毒的序列的信息，但我们并没有去分离和获得过 TG 十三这个活病毒。所以也就不存在泄露 TG 十三的这样一个可能。您刚才提到了这次新型冠状病毒，我们是没有的。您又提到了呃 TG 十三这个病毒也是没有的，活病毒是没有的。那我们其实一直以来致力于研究冠状病毒，那在我们的病毒库里头都没有活病毒吗？是一个什么样的一个病毒库？嗯，就像您刚才提到的，就。武汉病毒所的一些研究团队，比方说是郑丽老师的团队，他们从两千零四年就开始从事蝙蝠冠状病毒的相关的研究，但是他们的研究呢，都是围绕着 SARS 溯源这么一个主题所开展的。在他们研究过程中，他们更多的去关注的，呃，更深入的去研究的，以及更希望去分离获得的，都是和 SARS 比较相近的。这种蝙蝠冠状病毒，那我们知道这一次的新冠，其实它和 SARS 全基因组的相似性也只有百分之八十，可以说是还是有比较明显的差别的。嗯，所以在石老师以往的研究过程中，就没有关注这这种就是和 SARS 的相似性，呃，比较相对比较低一些的病毒。这就是为什么他们一开始没有尝试要去分离获得那个 TG 十三基因组的相似性，也只有百分之七十九点几。那这么多年下来呢，其实石老师他们确实分离获得过一些蝙蝠的冠状病毒，应该我们目前一共有三株，但是这三株病毒和 SARS 的相似性最高的有百分之九十六，但是和新冠病毒的相似性最高的都不超过百分之七十九点八。因为我们病毒所长期以来啊，自从 SARS 以后就致力于冠状病毒的研究，我们可以说是。呃，深入到很多地方去找这个病毒。那么我们这次新型冠状病毒爆发了以后，这样一个完全新的病毒，我们对它的溯源又做了哪些工作呢？国际学术界关于这个病毒的源头是什么？呃，目前的一个共识是，它应该是来源于自然界的某一种野生动物。嗯，但是就目前我们对于呃全球各地的。种类繁多的这些野生动物上，究竟携带着什么样的病毒？究竟呃在哪里存在和新冠相似性比较高的病毒？其实目前都没有明确的答案。这就为什么这个问题需要全世界的科学家一起合作来回答。所以，溯源的问题就归根结底，它还是一个科学问题，需要科学家用呃科学的这个数据和事实来做出判断。Chinese State Councillor and Foreign Affairs Minister Wang Yi says 
China is working with other G20 members to implement the debt service suspension initiative. This is aimed at easing Africa's debt burden as China mulls further bilateral support for the continent to fight against COVID-19. China is to further help Africa strengthen its independent development capabilities, properly arrange major China-Africa cooperation projects, and support African countries hit by the pandemic to resume production. Wang Yi made the statement when answering questions from Chinese and foreign media outlets about the country's foreign policy and external relations. The press conference happened on the sidelines of the third session of the 13th National People's Congress, the country's annual legislative session. China and Africa are good brothers who have shared the world together. Our people, having fought shoulder to shoulder for national liberation, are partners for common development. A few years back, we were together fighting Ebola. I fully agree with the AU Commission chairperson who is saying that Africa and China are friends, and more importantly, comrades in arms. Nothing can change or damage this friendship. In the battle against COVID-19, China and Africa have again stood by each other. Over 50 African leaders have expressed solidarity and support in phone calls or public statements. China has subsequently sent medical expert teams to Africa's five sub-regions and surrounding countries. Resident Chinese medical teams based in 45 African countries have acted swiftly to assist in the local response. They have held nearly 400 training sessions for tens of thousands of African medical workers. We also look after the African community in China, just like we take care of our own families. Already over 3,000 African students in Hubei and Wuhan have been safe and sound, except for just one who got infected but was soon cured. This year marks the 20th anniversary of the Forum on China-Africa Cooperation. China's relations with Africa have stood the test of time and continue to flourish. We will continue to stand by Africa as it fights the virus. We will send anti-epidemic assistance to African and other developing countries as a matter of priority. We are considering sending more medical expert teams to the continent. China will continue to deliver on the health initiative announced at the Forecard Beijing Summit. We will accelerate construction of the headquarters for the Africa CDC and help boost public health and African nations. In addition, China will continue to work with Africa on development capacity building. We will work out ways to move ahead with major ongoing cooperation projects and support African countries in reopening businesses soon to sustain Africa's economic momentum. We will work with other G20 members to implement the debt service suspension initiative to ease Africa's debt burden. We're also considering further bilateral support for African countries under the greatest strain to help our African brothers and sisters through this difficult time. To quote a Chinese saying, when brothers are of the same mind, they have the power to cut through metal. We're convinced that with help from China and the rest of the global community, the youthful continent of Africa will achieve greater and faster development after defeating COVID-19. Let's now take a look at your sports news. Here's what's ahead. Online gaming experiences major boom amid the COVID-19 lockdown. How would you create your legend? On the fields. On the tracks in the arenas of Africa. Were you born to be a player? Could this moment be yours? Sports scene, find your game. The
coronavirus pandemic has halted all sporting activities. However, for esports, it seems to be business as usual, maybe even better. Many people are now turning to e-sport as a way of bridging the gap that traditional sport has left. Virtual football tournaments, tennis events and motor racing have seen sporting celebrities pick up controllers and face their fans in a new chapter for e-sports. CGTN CS Duplessis has more. That was a good goal there. But unfortunately, overall... Esports is riding the wave of success and global attention while the rest of the traditional sports world stands by and waits patiently to resume. The worldwide gaming phenomenon that has captured the imagination of millions continues to enjoy immense growth despite several events being postponed and sports fans being confined to their homes. It is the closest thing and it, it, it feeds all the, the needs we have if you're a sporting fan. So obviously I love traditional sports, I also love esports, I love competition, I love watching the best of the best go against each other. I love the David Goliath stories that, that come into play and you can get all of that in esports. I don't think it will ever feed the same thrill as, as watching your favorite football team run onto a field or watching a goal live, but there's a different thrill that it feeds and I think for a lot of people they need that because they're missing it, so it's, it's an easy crossover. Esports is benefiting from a largely captive audience and is seeing a crossover between the sportsmen and women themselves and gaming, resulting in a huge upswing for the industry. Definitely, definitely. I mean, you see now all the, the, the you've seen the amount of celebrities, the amount of these, you know, soccer players, everyone. I mean, it's not necessarily about only the soccer guys playing FIFA or the, the Formula One guys racing to, to kind of create that virtual world. It's also those same guys, like I saw Sergio Aguero racing in a Formula One, you know, Formula One racing. So, the, you know, this is part of everybody's everyday lives, but only now it's kind of being brought up because quite frankly there's just nothing else to do um, but a hundred percent and again it's not it's not great to kind of benefit from it but at the end of the day oh, we'll take what we'll take what we can get although South Africa's eSports scene is very much in its infancy the signs are there that the rainbow nation possesses the talent to take on the global giants of gaming I definitely think we do have the talent to, to challenge the best and we've seen it just recently we had a selection of CSGO counter-strike global offensive players they actually relocated to America, and I think just this week, if I'm not mistaken, they beat one of the best teams in the world two days ago before we chatted, and are now ranked in the top 20 in the world in terms of teams and players. So that speaks for itself, the fact that they could go over with a lot of obstacles, a lot more obstacles than many of the other players they're against, and in a very short space of time get to that level. The borderless nature of gaming is allowing esports to continue uninterrupted during the global crisis and as a result could possibly go a long way to help sports brands stifled by the pandemic target a whole new generation of fans who weren't initially interested in traditional sports. The resulting crossover could well be beneficial for esports, but in fact traditional sports too. CS Duplessis, CGTN, Johannesburg. Two people from two Premier League clubs have